Today we're going to talk about imbalance, and to do that, let's consider an example of the F-16 uh, fighter jet. Here's a picture of one. One of the reasons this jet is so awesome is because it has a, an engine mounted back in here that provides a tremendous amount of power that lets it uh, fly faster than the speed of sound and do all kinds of great things. If uh, you were to remove the engine, you would see this. These are some vanes that direct the flow. These are fixed. And if you could pull this uh, front part off and look inside, you'd see um, a big fan. And this fan is made up of a bunch of blades that are all fit together onto a hub. And this fan spins at tremendous speeds and sucks uh, huge amounts of air into the engine that are mixed with fuel and burned and give the engine its thrust. So imagine though, um, if we just consider this disc, where is the center of mass? Right? It looks kind of symmetric, so I guess you could guess in the middle, but how do you know it's not one millimeter off from the center or something like that? Similarly, what are the principal axes of this disc? If you had a CAD model, you could put all the parts together and it would calculate that. But, you know, what about manufacturing variations or things that might move that around? What if it has a tiny misalignment, just one degree of misalignment, say, um, because of manufacturing imperfections? What would that do to the response and the dynamics? So that's the problem we're going to consider today. Um, and this is an adaptation of a problem from the book. If you think about this problem from the book and you let the the thickness of the disc go to zero, um, we'll get the thin disc problem. And that's how we're going to approximate a disc on the jet engine. Uh, this will cover all the essential ideas um, in a system that's easy to see and to draw. Um, the exact same things could happen with a jet engine or with lots of other things like car tires or car engines or other things that might need to be balanced. Okay, so let's consider this problem. But before we do, we'll review a more basic version. And this is the one that you might see in um, your first dynamics class in EMA 202. And in this problem, um, we'll just think about the static part of the imbalance, or what happens if the center of mass, um, which is here, what happens if that's not exactly on the axis of the shaft? And we can see all of this from a 2D picture that you see on the right here. So I've drawn a free body diagram. We'd have some reaction forces, RZ and RY. Those would be the net reactions from the bearings. We could have a moment, or we have a force due to gravity that acts on the center of mass, and uh, the applied torque that we use to spin up this wheel. And let's see what happens to all of those forces. So, um, and notice this system, we say it's statically imbalanced because under the influence of gravity, this, uh, and if the bearings were frictionless, this point, um, the center of mass would actually rotate so that it was aligned with gravity, right? So it was hanging down. So you could detect a static imbalance just by putting the machine on super uh, frictionless bearings and letting it go and seeing where it settles. Often it's difficult to get bearings that good, so that might not be the best way to do it. But that's one way. That's why we call it a static imbalance, because it exists even if the machine's not moving. Okay, so, but what does this do to the reaction forces, the forces that the... Uh, wheel is seeing, or that we would see in the mounting points for that jet engine. Well, we can look at the different sums of moments and things. First, let's look at the sum of the moments um, in the I direction. And um, if we do it for a general case, 
um, in this picture right here, the moment, the only moment we would have if we sum moments at the center, um, I'll just call that point O, would be mg, and then we get the cosine, um, we get a length epsilon cosine theta for the lever arm, and um, and that's all. And we can't have any um, acceleration in the x direction that's along, or, well, let's see, we can have that um, if we have an applied force, but if we didn't have any applied force, this would just be zero. So this would be the equation of static balance. And this equation says mass can't be zero, gravity can't be zero, epsilon isn't zero. So this um, tells us then that the system has to end at an equilibrium where cosine theta is equal to zero, or theta is equal to 90 degrees, um, or minus 90 degrees. And so here's the stable equilibrium. You could also have an e um, equilibrium where epsilon was, where, where the center of mass was up here. That would be the unstable equilibrium. Okay, so that's um, static balance. Let's look at the dynamic part of that balance, though. Um, so what happens if we apply a moment and we allow this to accelerate? So in that case, the sum of the moments in the x direction would be um, equal to the, um, the inertia about the x direction times theta double dot. And then that would be equal to the applied, um, the applied moments, or the left-hand side. We'd have the applied moment that I've drawn up here. And um, then we'd have this moment, um, which actually, if I was being more careful up there, that should have had a negative sign on it. All right, so that's equal to ixx theta double dot. So it says that um, to get a constant speed theta double dot or a constant acceleration, you'd have you'd have a little bit of ripple in the moment as this spins around. Right at different angles theta, the torque you would need to get a certain applied um, acceleration would be different. Once we got to steady state though, this force could go to zero, and um, but there would still be some ripple apparently in the speed. Um, I think that's what that's saying. Anyway, let's um, not spend time any more time on that, but Basically, this equation is kind of like the simple one from 202. The applied more moment causes an angular acceleration. Now, the imbalance actually comes in if we consider the sum of the forces. So the sum of the forces up here, we have the two reaction forces, Ry horizontally, Rz vertically. And by the way, I mean, those forces would would be would actually um, come in over here. I guess this would probably be the z. Um, you know, we'd have two different forces, and this is just the net resultant from all of those. Okay, so anyway, the sum of those forces, and then we have a force due to gravity in the vertical direction, and that has to be equal to the mass times the acceleration of the center of gravity. And the acceleration of the center of gravity, we've seen this before. This would be, um, we'd have a minus, minus epsilon theta dot squared in the radial direction, plus an epsilon theta double dot in the um, E theta direction, in the tangential direction. So we'd multiply all of that by the mass. And um, here is our equation. And now, for example, um, 
if we're running at constant speed, then the second term will vanish. And the only thing that we need to finish this up is a unit vector in the radial direction here. So um, we can get that as a cosine theta in the j plus a sine theta in the k. And now if we um, break this into pieces, we'd see that um, in the j direction, we get ry minus epsilon theta dot squared times the cosine part of this um, is equal to zero. So let's just move that around. Ry is equal to um, um, or actually, sorry, yeah, ry, yeah, ry should have been equal to a negative of that. All right, and um, rz would be similar. We just have the mg term in there, mg minus epsilon theta dot squared sine theta. And if we're running at constant speed, theta will be the rotation rate theta dot times time. So these will be time varying functions. Um, so we'll have harmonic forces. We'll be applying sinusoidal forces in time. Ry or Rz would look something like that. And so these are important forces. And um, if a machine isn't statically balanced, then these forces will occur at the rotation speed. And these forces could destroy the machine. Many, many machines over the years have been destroyed by this type of a force. And um, as you go on in your studies and you take vibrations, EMA 545, you'll learn about how to model the effect of these types of forces on flexible um, systems. Okay, so that's all we're going to say about that for now, though. But basically, all of this just boils down to the fact that static imbalance is nothing more than the centripetal acceleration um, causing an inward force, mass times epsilon times the speed squared, or we've been using theta dot squared in this problem, right? It's just that centripetal acceleration causing a force that wants to constantly pull the, um, the center of mass is constantly trying to pull the shaft away from its equilibrium. All right, so that's static imbalance. Let's now look at what happens dynamically. Now that we can deal with 3D dynamics, you can ta we can tackle this problem in a more complete way. So um, in this case, we're going to leave off all of those parts we just solved. So um, let's suppose that the center of mass is exactly on the axis of the rotor. And let's neglect gravity. By the way, um, here in this equation, if theta dot is a large number, for example, um, say on the engine of your car, you have 5,000 revolutions per minute, right? And then we would convert um, 2 pi radians would be 1 revolution. So um, 6 times 5,000, that's going to be greater than 30,000 um, radians per second. And then you're going to square that. So that's a huge force. Um, oh, and I just noticed there's a little mistake in here. We should have a mass vector in both of those as well. So let's fix this. This should be m epsilon squared. So they both have m. So epsilon might be a small number. You might only have an imbalance of one millimeter, but you're going to multiply it 
by a huge um, velocity, to p potentially. Um, and that, that can mean that even a tiny imbalance can cause a large or non-negligible force. So anyway, that's why we'll neglect gravity. We won't worry about it. Uh, and I, in this system, it's not really going to do anything all that interesting that we haven't seen before. Okay, so here's the problem. We imagine that the disk um, that we're interested in has been mounted on a shaft, but it's been mounted imperfectly so that there's some non-zero angle between the axis of the disk or one of the principal axes, right, and um, the axis of rotation, which we see as the horizontal axis. All right, so um, we can go ahead and solve then for the reaction forces that we would need at the bearings in this case, and we'll compare that with the static imbalance case. So here I've drawn um, all of the reaction forces. We'll have only um, a thrust force and X force on one side because otherwise it would be statically indeterminate. But um, these would be um, the different forces that are applied. And so we can go ahead and begin to solve this problem. One piece of information we're going to need are the inertia properties. So we're going to treat this as a thin disk where we have um, one half mr squared for the um, axial inertia and one fourth mr squared for the inertia and the y and the z directions and the two perpendicular directions. All right, and um, notice though these properties are only for a body fixed coordinate system, right? We can't apply these in the prime coordinate system. If we wanted to use the prime coordinate system, we'd have to apply a rotation matrix to the inertia matrix, um, to our diagonal inertia matrix. In this case, we have two planes of symmetry, so our inertia matrix is diagonal. So this is for x, y, z coordinates. If we wanted to use x prime, y prime, z prime, this would become a fully populated matrix. All right, so let's charge through and let's solve this problem. Remember, first we're gonna need to figure out the angular velocity of our body. In this case, it's easy. We just have a capital omega in the i prime direction, right? By the right hand rule, it's in the negative i prime direction. And um, we can then work out the angular acceleration is just the derivative of this. So negative omega dot i prime minus omega times the angular velocity of the prime coordinate system crossed into i prime. But this isn't moving, so this whole term is just zero. And if the speed is constant, um, this would be zero as well. Um, but actually, let's not. Let's treat the general case where that's not constant. All right. So this is the um, angular velocity and angular acceleration. Now we're going to need to write that in body fixed coordinates to be able to apply our inertia properties to it. So we do the rotation that says this is equal to a cosine theta in the axis of the disk plus a sine theta, oops, actually minus, minus a sine theta in the j prime direction, right? Or in other words, to get um, okay, yep, yeah. to get this axis here, we need a cosine, um, and then we'll also have to come by a sine in the negative y. All right. So, um, we're doing good so far. 
making some progress. So now we're ready to start looking at sums of forces and sums of moments. Let's start with the sum of the forces. Sum of the forces in the x prime direction. And by the way, notice just because I have to do um, angular momentum in the little x, y, z coordinate doesn't mean I have to sum forces in that direction. I can do whatever direction I want for the force sums. So some of the forces in the x prime direction, that just gives us our axial reaction force in the i prime, right? So, um, um, so we just have that one force. There can't be any acceleration. The center of mass of this disk can't move itself side back and forth, right? So there can't be any acceleration that way. So that tells us that that reaction force will just be zero. All right. Now if we sum um, forces in the y prime direction, so um, that's our vertical direction here. Um, we just get these two forces and we haven't included gravity. So we just get ay prime plus by prime. And again, if there's no acceleration allowed up and down, then those will also be zero. So um, that tells us that ay prime is equal to the negative of by prime. So um, those two are equal and opposite reaction forces. We could have come in and we could have drawn this one as being the negative. Well, if I draw it down that way, I'll just say it has a magnitude by prime. All right. Okay, and now if we sum moments um, in the z direction, we get something similar that says that az prime is equal to negative bz prime. So um, we're making some progress. We've eliminated two of our unknowns, but we still don't know what by prime and bz prime are. So um, so we need more equations. So we're going to have to continue the solution. So um, what we can do is we'll sum moments at the center of gravity. Um, and we'll set that equal to hg dot. All right, so first of all, let's work out the left-hand side of that equation. Um, and if we go up here, notice by, these two by moments, um, by and ay will give us a torque about the, um, the um, k-axis. All right. Um, so we could say then that we will get, for example, from the first one, we'll get, um, we have a lever arm of L over 2 times this force by prime. Here's our lever arm. There's by prime. That's going to give a moment that um, this way or a positive z direction moment. And then the force on the other side will give us a negative. So um, those are both in the k direction. All right, and then um, these forces coming out of the board, these B, AZ and BZ, we're going to do something similar. BZ will give us a um, negative moment about Y prime. So um, for this one, we could say we get a negative L over 2 BZ prime and a positive L over 2 AZ prime in the j prime direction. And notice I'm just writing this in whatever way will make it easy to keep track of at first so that I, um, 
I can always go back and straighten out unit vectors later. I just want to make sure I get it right to start. Okay, and then last but not least, we had a torque about the I prime axis, this torque right here. All right? So um, those are all of our forces, and they're going to be equal to HG dot. All right? So now we need to work out HG dot, and for that, let's use the equation that says this is equal to I alpha plus omega cross I omega. So um, um, we have our inertia matrix up here. Notice if we plugged in the numbers, um, they all have a common factor of 1 fourth m r squared. So our inertia matrix would actually just be a 2, 1, 1, all the rest zeros. Right? So we get a 1 half for the i x x and a 1 fourth for the other two. All right, so um, plugging that in, we'll get, I'll put that up front, 2, 1, 1. And, um, and then we need to multiply that by alpha. And alpha is up here. We have negative omega dot times I prime. So we will end up getting minus capital omega dot cosine theta omega dot put this is a plus omega dot sine theta and nothing in the k direction. So that would be that first term. And then our second term, um, we're going to have that same matrix, 2, 1, 1. But we're going to have to cross that with um, that same matrix again, times omega. And let me just copy it down here. Our omega was equal to negative omega in the I prime direction, or um, similar to what we have here, cosine theta in the I plus omega sine theta in the J. All right, so we'll have another one fourth m r squared, and then we're going to have um, two one one. We're going to multiply that by negative omega cosine theta, omega sine theta. All right, so now we can go ahead and do that multiplication. And actually, um, it's a diagonal matrix. This is trivial to do. This just becomes a minus 2 and a 1 there. So um, this is what we have to evaluate the cross product of. All right. And notice, um, Oops, then actually I'm making a mistake here. This was supposed to be omega cross hg, omega cross i omega. Actually, this first part. I shouldn't be writing the inertia matrix. The first part was just the omega vector. And the omega vector was what we have right here above. Omega cosine theta and omega sine theta. Okay, this should be what we want. All right, so here's our equation. We just have to evaluate this cross product, and then we are good to go. So I'm um, just simplifying this a little bit. Everything has this 1 fourth um, m r squared in it, so we'll just pull that out of every single term. We'll get a minus 2 omega dot cosine theta, a positive omega dot sine theta and a zero in that first term. And then the second term, notice here um, we're going to get an i cross j 
and a j cross i. So we're going to get two terms, and if we work that out, um, they're all going to be in the k direction. So the second part, we'll get 0 in i and j, um, but we will get uh, two terms. Um, this first one, i crossed into j is a positive k, so that'll give us a negative omega cosine theta sine theta. The second one will end up giving a negative and a negative or a positive 2, oops, there should have been omega squared, positive 2 omega squared. Um, again, cosine theta sine theta. And so those two terms, here we have a negative and a 2. These two terms are going to cancel just to give us a plus 1 omega squared cosine theta sine theta. All right, so um, that's in the k direction. And now we have all of this worked out, right? So all of this is our hg dot, and that has to be equal to these applied moments on the other side. All right, so let's, um, let's start to look at some of these. Um, if we take both sides of the equation above, and we dot them into some specific direction, we can start to pick out um, different terms. So um, let's start with the k direction. So the k direction um, up above, we had this first term. And remember that by or ay was equal to the negative of by. So um, we actually have L over 2BY plus L over 2BY, or just LBY is equal to um, um, let's see um, I prime. Let's just check I prime and J prime. Yep, these are all perpen perpendicular to K. So when we dot, for example, if we dot this term with k, that's just going to equal to 0. And similarly for the i. So we're not going to need to worry about that. And then that will be equal to the bottom row here, 1 fourth mr squared, omega squared. I'm going to write this sine theta, cosine theta, because that somehow seems more natural. Right? So, what is this? Right? This is, um, this tells us that the reaction force By is going to be um, proportional to the speed squared. We have some inertia property of the disk. And um, then we have um, two terms that depend on the angle, a sine theta and a cosine theta. Right, and in this case, theta, remember, is this angle between the true principal axis of the disk and the actual rotation axis of the disk. So, um, so those are constants as far as we're concerned. And, and by, um, so it says by will be a force in this direction. But um, if we were to look at this disk as it rotates, at any instant in time, if, if this whole picture rotates, we have to rotate by prime and ay prime. Oh, by the way, I should have called this by prime down here. Yep. Anyway, those have to be in a coordinate system that's attached to the picture and that's rotating at omega. Or in other words, we have to attach x prime, y prime, z prime to the disk. And they're oriented as shown. But so that whole picture has to rotate with the disk. 
So in other words, um, by prime is a force, if we were looking in on the end of the disk, it's a force that's rotating as the disk rotates. And so it's similar to that static imbalance force. It's chasing the disk around. Only in this case, when we look at the whole system, we have actually a couple. Oops, actually the signs came out this way. By prime. By prime. And um, we can check that this makes sense because if we were to think about um, drawing the different vectors, remember our angular velocity is just a vector along the axis of the disk. But um, when we get hg, we multiply by the inertia matrix, we get a 2, 1, 1. Or in other words, we stretch the x component. Right, so if we had x, and y components. We're going to stretch the x component a little bit more um, than the y component. So what's that going to do? Um, if we go out, if here we had to go out, say, um, one unit in x, let's see, we kind of need the negative x-axis to see this. If we had to go out one unit in x and one unit in y to get there, now we're going to stretch two units in x and one unit in y. And so all of that tells us then that hg is a vector out this way, and the shaft is rotating like this, so hd dot is coming out of the page. And so this moment, this couple from by prime has to also be in that direction. Or remember, the other way we could think of this is that the rotor wants to um, turn itself this way and these moments have to resist it. And that's interesting, actually, right? That the disk actually wants to straighten itself out. And it's just the fact that we've, if we've rigidly mounted it and caused it to spin about an axis it doesn't want to spin about, that it complains by making these two reaction forces. So, um, so the rotor wants to spin itself like that. All right, so that's, um, that's basically the key to dynamic balance. It's um, if the inertia properties of the body are not aligned with the um, rotation axis, then we'll get this stretching. Now notice that if the x-axis had been aligned with the shaft, then we would have had a zero component in the y direction. Right. Um, we would have had, if we had this alignment, we'd have a zero component of omega in the y direction. And so in that case, hg would be aligned with the axis of rotation, and we get no um, moments here. These would both go to zero. All right. So um, that's basically the key to dynamic balance. I guess I will just show you one more part of this problem. Another thing that we might look at up here is the torque that we need. Say we wanted to pull out um, that torque right there. Right? Um, the easiest way to do that would be to dot both sides of the equation in the I prime direction. So if we did that um, on the left-hand side, we just get that negative gamma. So I guess to be complete, I should write out the sum of the moments dotted in the I prime direction equals hg dot dotted in the I prime direction. All right, so that's just going to give us the negative gamma. And then we're going to need to take um, everything that we had up here 
and I prime is not going to be affected by these k terms, so it's really just that first term. That's going to be equal to 1 fourth mr squared negative 2 omega dot, right? Yep, negative 2 omega dot cosine theta omega dot sine theta 0. And then we need to dot that into the i prime unit vector and the i prime unit vector was cosine was negative cosine theta sine theta zero and so if we put this all together we're going to get a cosine squared and a sine squared and it all kind of simplifies down to just saying one fourth m r squared um, oh, actually, no, we don't quite get um, that working out because of the two-factor. Actually, right, so we're actually going to get um, one-fourth mr squared. Everything has a omega dot term. Ah, okay, nope, sorry, I'm making a mistake here. Nope, nope, this is right. Um, oh, I just flipped the sign is the problem. Um, sorry, if we go back up here, I prime is cosine theta minus sine theta. The negative came from the omega dot. So they, they at least have the same sign. So basically everything has um, um, every term here um, has the omega dot, but then for, on the top part we'll get a minus 2 cosine squared theta and on the bottom, we'll get a minus sine squared theta. All right, so um, this is the torque gamma then that we need. We can make all these positive. This is the torque gamma that we would need to cause this to accelerate. And it's basically um, the inertia for theta equals zero, this goes to our one half m r squared. When theta is not equal to zero, it's telling you that the inertia effectively is some com somewhere in between the one fourth and the one half cases. All right, so nothing um, too crazy going on there. Um, and I'll leave it as an exercise for you guys to show that if you sum the moments in the j prime direction. Um, what you would actually get is that minus LBZ is going to be F to equal to one fourth minus one fourth MR squared omega dot sine theta cosine theta. All right, so um, the Z reaction force is zero. if omega dots equal to zero. So if you're not accelerating, that one goes to zero. So in the case of steady motion, we, we can see, think of those two forces as disappearing for omega equals zero, right? So um, those ones are forces we wouldn't need to worry about. So this imbalance force actually only is in the y prime direction and it again, follows the rotor around as it rotates. All right, so hopefully this has helped you to see, um, to get a little bit of practice with solving these types of problems and to see an application. Um, and how dynamic balance is different than static balance and how we can understand it. Let's try to put some numbers on this, though, and make it a little more concrete. So let's look at a specific example. And um, if you're from my generation, you would know about compact discs. If you're not from my generation, maybe you know about Blu-rays or Ultra HD Blu-rays or something like that. But they all have the same geometry in all cases. We have a disc, um, you know, a few inches radius, about six inches or so, four inches radius or so, uh, um, fairly thin. Um, here's the density we would guess for the plastic that they're made of. So we could work out the mass, only 65 grams, right? 
not very heavy little discs. You've picked them up before. Um, and if we multiply by g, we can convert that to newtons. So um, in a compact disc player, those used to spin at 500 RPM, um, between 500 and 200 RPM. And a similar kind of speed is used on Blu-ray, though um, if you have one of these in your computer, and possibly even in some of the new video players, the speed actually can vary. So um, Blu-ray and, and uh, CD have this, or the same geometry and everything. The only difference is that a Blu-ray was able to cram way more data into the same amount of area. So as we spin at the same speed, the amount of data that's coming past the read laser is much, much higher in the Blu-ray. But mechanically, they're the same. So, um, let's suppose we work out some numbers. Um, let's suppose we just have, um, and let's do this at 52 times. This is a recording speed that you might have on a computer one. So we get to more interesting speeds, 10,000 RPM. If we um, work that out and we take the equation that we just derived and we look at the sum of the moments, um, what we end up with is uh, this factor, 277 newton meters times the product sine theta cosine theta. So we have to pick a theta to say what this would be. So let's just say we had one degree of imbalance. In that case, the moment is 4.8 newton meters. Is that a big moment or a little moment? Well, um, notice that the weight was less than one newton, right? So basically this says that if we could take our disk and we could mount it um, such that we have a one meter uh, lever arm between these two forces, remember this is our disk here in the middle. If we had a one meter lever arm, these forces would be ten times the weight. All right, but that's not going to be very practical. You're never going to sell people Blu-ray players if they're one meter tall, right? You're actually going to have to mount the, have these forces be very, very tight in there, right? Maybe, maybe even just a few millimeters or one centimeter, one hundredth of a meter, right? So if this goes down by a factor of 100, this goes up by a factor of 100. And now we're talking about a force that's a thousand times the weight. All right, so this starts to become a really important force. And um, you would need a ton of metal, very, very stiff structure if you wanted to take one of these discs and actually mount it rigidly. So they came up with a really clever solution. They actually mount the um, disc not on a rigid shaft, but they mount it on a shaft that has um, some springs that are very flexible. And so as the disc spins, if there's an initial misalignment, the disc is free to right itself such that it's spinning about its principal axis. And these will be whipping up and down, but these are made to be very light and very flexible so that they don't resist the motion much. All right. So, um, so that's a solution. Um, I'll show you. There's an interesting little clip we can see of a video here. This is what would happen if um, you rigidly mount the hub of a disc. And I don't know if you can see. Can you see the deflection? There's several millimeters, several times the th thickness deflection of this disc as it's spinning around. They're spinning it at just the right speed so that these reaction moments are deflecting the disc and the disc shatters into tons and tons of little pieces, right? So that's what would happen if we didn't um, if we didn't do this, if we if we let this force um, um, go wild. Uh, now, to really understand what's going on there, there's a resonance phenomenon going on there. Um, and so you really need some concepts from EMA 545 to fully understand that. But the, the 
you can understand now where the force comes from that might drive some of that motion, drive some of that vibration that you are seeing. All right, so that concludes um, our lecture on dynamic static and dynamic balance. And again, I hope it's clear now, the two, one of them has to do with a misalignment of the center of mass with the rotation axis, and the other has to do with misalignment of the rotation axis with the principal axes of the body. And these are both common problems, and um, these types of forces that we just derived here are found in virtually every machine. Um, nothing is ever balanced perfectly, either statically or dynamically. So these types of forces will always be measured around the bearings of high-speed machines. And now we can understand where they come from and how we can design to minimize them. We will see you next time.